Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tavara is Sodavanta Bamunjantu Satang. So, this is the full moon night of December 2009. And the uh, winter solstice will be uh, another week or so on the 21st, 22nd. December, so there's a reflection on change, the changing of the seasons. The shortest day of the year is the summer solstice, longest night. And then after that, it starts longer days and shorter nights. Full moons and new moons and on and on like this. It, this is to contemplate the way it is in terms of the system we're living in, the, the seasonal changes and so forth. So I've always <coughs> appreciated in the, this particular tradition, Theravada tradition, the, the lunar days because you have to pay more attention to <laughs> to notice what the whether it's a full moon or a new moon or a half moon or whatever. <coughs> so we do get caught up in just, you know, s solar calendars with <coughs> everything is Saturday, Sunday, and work days and so forth, Sabbath days on Saturdays or Sundays, and we get institutionalized easily into just going along with what is uh, taken for granted. But uh, I want to say that this way we kind of just observing change because this is, the, this is the way this realm is. It's all about change. Inexorable, relentless changingness of the conditions. So we this evening also we have the three uh, Anagorikas, Francis, uh, and uh, Norman and Tejas. Welcome back, Norman, <laughs> who was a monk for many years. Very seldom do disrobe, monks who disrobe do they come back, so this is quite... Uh, praiseworthy thing to do. <coughs> People disrobe because of they, they uh, lose faith or they attracted to worldly things or you know any like anything anything you're involved in you have uh, you have inspiration and then kind of desperation. In monastic life, the same thing. You, whether you get married or mon monastic or have a job or whatever, there's a initial interest and fascination and then it reaches a peak and then it starts going the other way. <coughs> get critical, disillusioned, uh, bored, with the uh, institution or the convention or the people you're living with. <coughs> so this is about change also. We, we can't sustain inspiration as a kind of continuous experience in the holy life. Uh, you read any about people that have developed the holy life in different religions, it's the same. You, you, know, you can't sustain uh, kind of an inspired state of mind. It, it's what brings you maybe into this life, 
through inspiration and faith and that, but uh, to depend on that, as we all know, it, inspiration uh, is also impermanent. So some people always want the inspiration or the honeymoon, the romantic part of the marriage or the, the, you know, the, the good side of life, and uh, very seldom, even when it gets to the other side, uh, then they want to go into something else, want, want to have a new relationship or d do something that inspires them because uh, inspiration is a nice feeling, to feel inspired and uplifted and dedicated and that to the spiritual life. But also this is uh, because of this, this reflection on change, on anicca, impermanence, then we, we start observing this, being the puto, the one that's aware of this, of the way things are, the changingness of the seasons, the full moon, that which is aware of the full moon, even though tonight you probably can't see it. But that which is aware uh, they, just for example, if you could see the full moon, you went out and looked at it, you wouldn't, uh, would, you know, if you were desperate, you say, I, d I want a full moon every night, would be the most ridiculous thing to demand of life, <laughs> because that's not the way it is. <clears throat> uh, so it's, and that which is aware of the full moon, is that me? Is that uh, some kind of personal ability I have, uh, an identity that I hold to? Or is it just the way things are from this position of being a human individual that, that has, uh, whose vision is adequate enough to, to see, to perceive the full moon? And so this, this is like reflecting on the way it is. It, it's empty, isn't it? It's not, it's not, I can't claim that I have a special a unique ability to see the full moon uh, and that it's mine or the moon belongs to me, that would be kind of madness. You'd think I was m mentally deranged if I started claiming that the moon belongs to me. <coughs> but we do that with, uh, with the other conditions, the body for example, your own body. You actually, it's a kind of madness that we're addicted to, that the society indulges us in, is that we, that I am this body, and this body is mine. And so then we, then we, when we identify with the body, then with, with its appearance, with its gender, with its uh, color, with its age, with its shape, and on and on like this, and then we, have various views about being attractive, unattractive, uh, which is better, black or white, or male or female, and it gets into an endless uh, uh, clash of views and opinions and hurt feelings. <coughs> and wars and quarrels take place because of this madness. It's a kind of, it's a craziness that is uh, part of our culture everyone, in whatever culture, the tendency is to identify with the body. So using the metaphor of the moon, since we don't claim the moon, uh, also we begin to be aware of the body as the body rather than as mine or me. So it's no different than the moon actually, it's just, it's closer is the problem. And we have to uh, live with it for a, a lifespan, which can include all kinds of pleasurable and painful uh, sensations. But the point of Buddhist meditation, of reflecting on the way it is, is to be the knower <coughs> of the condition rather than the condition itself. As long as we believe we're the condition, then we're, we're mad, we're crazy. 
That's a kind of, and that's called, uh, and most of the world is that way. The society we live in is actually a crazy one. Uh, so it's because everybody believes they are their bodies and their personalities and all the other things, their memories, their emotions. Notice that the, 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 in Buddhism they talk a lot about emptiness and, and anatta, non-self. This, w this word anatta is not non-self. And so this sense of a self, the, you know, of me and mine, is, uh, is, is taken for granted. I am this body, I am this person, I am uh, my position, my, um, my appearance, Age and all that is definitely me and mine. So this is uh, seen from from this reflective point rather than operate. But we're not in in this life to operate from a personal perspective. So it's not to to reinforce this identity with the conditioned realm, but to be able to see it for what it is. Now when we begin to appreciate that's what the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha means. It's not a not some kind of mystical, metaphysical formula, a magical formula. It's a reflection. So the taking refuge uh, in Buddha, Bhutang Sarangachami, this is this is a reminder of being this Bhutto, of being awake and aware in the present. So this, the Buddha is awakened consciousness within an individual. It's not anybody, you can't claim to be a Buddha, you know, some kind of personal achievement or quality. But we take, in, the, in this tradition, we use this, this Pali language, we say, I take refuge in the Buddha, Bhutang Sarnangachami. In the Thai forest tradition, we use the mantra Puto as a, as a continuous reminder. Bhutto is, is being uh, awakened, attentive here and now to the way it is, to the changingness of whatever one is feeling or experiencing through the senses, through the body, pleasant or unpleasant, right or wrong, good or bad. <coughs> so, in the, if you pursue this, now the aim in this life, the monastic conventions, are to, is a vehicle to help you through a lifespan. It's an expedient means, it's not an end in itself. And it, it's merely a functionary means to reflect from not to grasp or identify with. So when we, we have uh, these conventions, we keep reminding ourselves our refuge is in Buddha, Bhutto, rather than in being a monk or a nun or an anagarika, anagarika, samanera, senior, junior, and all the rest. These are not refuges. They're expedient conventions that are empty. They're empty conditions. So to, to begin to really uh, have an insight into emptiness of conditioned phenomena. Now the most difficult conditioned phenomena to see emptiness in is our emotions. Because uh, emotions are the very conditions that, that keep telling us that this is me, my feelings, my opinion, my body, my rights, what I like and don't like, is these, are, these, are, these can be very strong emotional uh, reactions we have to, to the life we're living. Anger and greed, sexual desire, uh, jealousy, fear, 
And these are kind of primal emotions. They're part of the, the human condition, you know, the, or the mammalian condition. You notice the mammalian species is, gets angry, it is lust, sexual desire, and, and uh, even gets jealous, fear. The animal realm is a fear realm. And if you just look at nature, the animal world around us, the squirrels and, and the foxes and all the rest, deer, it's a survival and through fear. So fear, this is a fear realm, you know, uh, because it is a sense realm. We're experiencing uh, the sensitivity of pleasure, pain. Survival, trying to just survive, in, in, you know, to get enough to eat and shelter and so forth. Procreate the species. This is part of the survival mechanisms, instinct, that are part of a universal system. They're, they're, and yet, in the human realm, we tend to align ourselves with these a lot, take it all very personally. We, we, and especially modern societies are very much identified with my sexual desires, my fears, my anger, my greed, my jealousy. And, and then, they're, then they're judged. We judge ourselves, you know, like an ideal person is, uh, is kind and generous and they're not jealous. They're brave, they're not afraid, they don't get angry, they're very patient, forgiving, and compassionate. That's an ideal that we, that is very inspiring, it can be very inspiring, the saints, and we want, often perhaps we project that onto people in our societies, wanting them to be these saintly beings. But in reflecting on the way it is, we're not, we're not trying to project onto life how we'd want it, but we're noticing that it's like this. So the closest thing you can observe is your own feelings. Because you have to, you know, even what you're feeling, you're, wherever you are, you're going to be feeling something or other. Whether you're here in the temple or in your room, alone or in a group or whatever because this is a feeling realm, a sense realm. Sens sensitivity is like this. So this variability that we have to observe sensitivity, this is what the Buddha uh, teaching is about, is being this awareness itself of sensitivity, rather than becoming a sensitive person or trying to make yourself insensitive. Being sensitive can be very painful because we, we, you know, it is a continuous a kind of irritation, challenge in this realm of, uh, and there's so much fear in, in that's natural to this uh, to this realm we're living in. And anger is a primal emotion. Sexual desire uh, is primal to the species. You know, it's not personal, it's not some kind of something's wrong or uh, it's not being idealistic about sexuality, it's just noticing that these human bodies are like this. They're sexual forms, they have these energies. We get, we, we experience anger, fear, jealousy. We get bored, we get inspired, we we, um, the different, we have doubts, we feel insecure, we want safety, certitude, guarantees, stability, and all the rest. And of course, this is a time right now, and you listen to the news on the radio, everything seems to be falling apart. And desper every, every day you hear some, some, some famous, corporation or company 
going bankrupt, <laughs> desperately trying to bail him out, or uh, you know, with fantastic amounts of money, and that because uh, for the past few decades we've been able to perfect our greediness to a level I don't think human humanity's ever been able to achieve, to be as greedy as as the human beings have been in the past. Uh, 50 years. And it's greed that makes the economy work, doesn't it? Just making, making you go greedy to want to spend all your money on buying things that, that uh, are not totally unnecessary, most of them. But this is uh, stimulating greed as a, as a way of promoting uh, this sense of every, you know, getting what we want, we like, we have that feeling of when we get what we want, we want something and we get it, we like that feeling of getting our way, getting what we want. <coughs> and then we feel angry or frightened or insecure when we can't get what we want. And we, and we think something's wrong with with oneself or with uh, that which is preventing you from getting what you want you put your what you think is the is the villain that's preventing you from getting what you you really want and feel you have to have so this is this is a reflection it's not a criticism but just noticing this desire Desire dunha is is this realm is a desire realm, wanting and not wanting. And so, in Buddhist meditation and vipassana, insight practices in uh, Theravada Buddhism, about being putting yourself in the position of buto tamo sankho butang sernangachami, namang sernangachami, sankang sernangachami. You know, like the Vinagarikas tonight that uh, made a formal uh, request for taking these three refuges. Now this can be just a ceremony uh, that you go through to, you know, but you may not understand the significance of it. So pointing to the significance of this taking the three refuges is not just <coughs> Theravada Buddhist uh, ceremonial practices, it, it's something to reflect on. Over the years that I've been a monk, I've reflected on this, this formula, Bhutang Sernangachami. You know, till when I, first, when I first ordained, I just memorized it. It didn't, its significance still was very just intellectual, I kind of got the idea of taking refuge in the Buddha, but it, it was merely a kind of definition from the brain. It hadn't reached the heart yet. But I could say it in order to get through the ceremony. Then over the years, 42 years, 43 years, this really, you know, is a profound thing to to think, if you're going to think something profound, think Bhutang Sarnangachami. I take refuge in the Buddha. And then, and not just the, the thought itself to attach to, but what does that really mean in terms of here and now, this very moment, when I think, when I'm thinking Bhutang Sarnangachami. So it's a reminder, isn't it? I'm using that, those words to remind myself not to take refuge in my feelings or uh, views and opinions, habits, worldly conditions. So then it, it's like buto, getting, making it a shorter reflection. Buto is easier to, to think than butang sarnangachami, which takes a longer time. <laughs> now you got Bhutto is a very simple mantra. And to me then that is reminder. You know, 
the one uh, gets carried away with all the problems of the world, the fears and the uh, anxieties, the uncertainties, the insecurities, uh, and the changing conditions. Well, there's so many frightening predictions for the future, climate change and pollution and overpopulation and nuclear war and all these things are very threatening uh, to, on a global level. It's not just personal anymore, it's, it's global. So, uh, in, that, in that way we begin to see, you know, we, there's no, where can we hide? Where can we run away to? If it's just a kind of personal thing, we, we, we just run away to find some other place. If it's just a national thing, we, we go to Canada or some other place to get away from it. But if it's um, global, where, where's the escape? Where's the escape from fear and anger and the unexpected catastrophe, possible catastrophes in a solar system that is very mysterious and vast and frightening and threatening to us. You hear about meteorites or various things being crashing into the earth. They, have, they make exciting films around this possibility of the end of the world, the end of the earth. There's some huge meteorite or invasion from Mars takes place. And we're exposed to, to maniacal weird forms, green men with eyes that stick out of their heads like insects and antennae and they have no conscience and no shame. Now we can create a fantasy world about creating the most frightening images and people pay good money to go see these films which makes you wonder what <laughs> why we like to be scared because that's also exciting, isn't it? It's exciting to contemplate the end of the world, to hear all the bad news and the threats and dangers that exist in terms of the enemy, the terrorists that are lurking in every train station in Britain, the possible, you know, suicide bombers that could destroy everything that we are attached to and love and depend on for sense of well-being. So there's this create when we think about this is this is just common news these days. Epid, uh, epidemics uh, could take place. Terrible kind of possibilities for pain and misery haunt us day by day. <clears throat> so in this way we, we do want security, safety, certainty. And the, the, the Buddha could see that this was, we're, we're wanting something that's not possible. It's, this is not certain, this realm that we're living in. It's all about uncertainty, insecurity. It's about change about loss, about getting old, losing the loved, losing your health, dying, and all the rest. Not as some kind of morbid obsession with gloom and doom, but to awaken the human individual to the way it is, to the deathless reality that is the refuge in Dhamma. Now when you talk about the deathless reality, we can't define it. You can't, where, what is it? When you try to think about it or wonder about it, you get caught in doubt. Is there such a, is, what, what, people have asked me, what is the deathless? The unconditioned, unborn, uncreated, unformed. What is Nibbana? And if there's no self, if everything is anatta, you know, then who am I? If I'm no, nothing, I'm going to start thinking again. If I'm nothing, I don't have any soul or self. 
And then I feel, you know, I can feel emotionally very upset by that because even if I have some inferior identity, at least it's something to hold on to. And I think I'm the, I'm the worst person alive is some kind of identity where, you know, if I, if, there's, if I don't have any identity, if there's nothing to cling to, nothing to identify with, who am I? So in this uh, refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, it's about not trying to f- find a, a refuge that you cling to, not trying to find something called Buddha Dhamma Sangha, some, something you've got to, to get hold of. It's, it's, it's about awakening, recognizing, realizing the way it is. So Dhamma is the way it is. And, th- and that isn't about saying the way it is is right or wrong, good or bad, what it should or shouldn't be. It's like this. And as you, and so this is what mindfulness is when we say, use the word sati sampachanya, sati panya. Mindfulness and wisdom awaken, this is our, this is the, the great ability of this human birth being a human being, rather than being a, an animal, where we merely have to put up with our karma, you know, whether we're a cat or a dog or a bird or a rat or whatever, we, we have to live according to that karma. And we also have to live according to our karma as a, as an, on the animal level. But also, this sense of Bhutang Sarnangachami taking refuge in the Buddha is the potential that we have as human individuals to awaken to Dhamma, to the way it is. Which is not personal, it's not about me and my Dhamma. And, and that, that, that's nothing to do with it. When I start thinking about my karma and me, then I'm back into that realm of the personal, the way I define myself and see myself as a person, uh, as a good person, bad person, and so forth. And that can change. We see ourselves in various ways according to other conditions. <coughs> so when we think good thoughts and, and people tell us how wonderful we are, then we feel good. When we think mean and nasty thoughts and people tell us how mean and nasty we are, then we feel like that. And so, it, you know, the personality will change according to how we're feeling, the weather, the time of day, whether we're healthy or sickly, and on and like this. Our personality is a very dependent, changeable condition. But that which is aware of the personality. Now, I can, you know, whatever I feel as a person, my own personal habits, liking this, not liking that, wanting this, not wanting that. But there's an awareness of that wanting and not wanting. So then that is the puto tamo relationship. The awakened consciousness observing the way it is. What I like and don't like, it changes. I can't make life into what I want as a kind of permanent uh, fixed condition. Sometimes I get what I want and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I feel inspired and happy and and loved and successful, and sometimes I can feel the opposite. Feel miserable, despairing, hopeless. But that which is aware of the feeling, because we all know what, you know, you can always be aware of what you're feeling. It's like this. So the emotions, the emotional habits that one has, whatever they might be, is not the issue. It's not about 
having only good emotions, positive emotions, but being aware of emotions that are changeable according to condition. Like when we're praised, admired, respected, liked, we have high status, we have good health, we're good looking, we're successful and prosperous, then we feel happy when that all comes together. But then, like anything, to try to sustain that illusion is impossible. Uh, and so, you know, you, as you get older, your looks fade, uh, health is, gets weaker, people, you make enemies, people get jealous uh, of you, uh, they see your faults and weaknesses, they can uh, pick you apart, criticize you, uh, humiliate you, and then you feel despairing, angry, upset, lost. So re recognize how, what a helpless, on a personal level, how helpless we are. We, you know, we're kind of victims of circumstances, as personalities. If we don't get what we want, if we don't have all the best, then we have to, you know, we, we identify even with the fact that I'm the ugliest person in the whole world, nobody loves me. At least that's an identity. But in the, in this uh, awareness, puto tamo sanko, whatever, whether you're the most beautiful or the most ugly and everybody loves me or everybody hates me, that awareness is the refuge. And that feeling of success and failure, love and hate or whatever is, it is what it is in the present moment. But try to sustain it. Try to, try to feel that way all the time. And you'll begin to see that it's very changeable. So this is what we mean by mindfulness and then investigation, looking into, not, not criticizing, not trying to define things and saying this is best, this is the best and that's the worst. It's not about the quality or the, or the quantity of condition phenomena, but discerning condition phenomena is just that, whether it's uh, a, a fleeting thought, uh, a sensation through the eye, the ear, nose, tongue, body, uh, uh, emotional feeling of happiness or misery or just boredom or doubt, uncertainty, confusion, whatever uh, emotion is present, that which is aware of that emotion. By continuously investigating this, and discerning, then, then you will begin to let go of these, ident of these habitual identities, this attachment and clinging to the uh, condition itself. Now this is, uh, this is a result of this kind of practice. From my own experience, having had uh, 42 years to put this into practice. <laughs> you know, it has a very powerful effect, if you, but you have to keep doing it. You, and that's not just a kind of sitting on a zafu an hour a day, but it's a continuous willingness to, to investigate, to observe, to be the knower, to be the puto seeing dhamma rather than this person with these problems. So the, the personality, the sense of a self, is always about a person with problems. Likes and dislikes, desires for happiness and security, fear of loss, of insecurity. That's personal. And so that is, uh, when we live on that level, then we do, we suffer. Because how much control do we have over the economy 
the political system, even the bodies that we identify with. How, how can you make them into what you want them to be? You know, and, and preserve their youth and their vigor and their health. You know, people spend enormous amounts of money trying to sustain the illusion of youth and, and good health. But at the end of the day, you lose it. No matter how much money you spend on cosmetic surgery and vitamins and health foods, you're going to die. Body. <laughs> <coughs> you know, you can squint your eyes when you look into a mirror. Like, now I have, my vision isn't so good anymore. So when I take off my glasses and look into the mirror, I look better. than when I look into the mirror with my glasses on. <laughs> so there's a, you know, and having fading vision at 75 is a kind of advantage in a way. You don't look so bad. But this is an illusion. <laughs> and it would be a source of suffering rather than humor if, you know, if, I, if, if that was what I depended on. Keeping, you know, squinting my eyes and t with, without my glasses. If that's how I have to live the rest of my life, it's rather kind of a foolish old man, isn't it? Silly old fart. But because of spending these years in this kind of meditation, investigating Dhamma, then you do, you be, the, 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 the deathless reality, this is real, it's not just some kind of, you know, idea I have in my head or some kind of belief in some kind of abstract realm called the deathless. It's actually a, a rea it's reality itself, this sense of the real, uh, it, this reality, it has this Stability, this unshakability that comes through awareness, not through controlling anything. Not, you don't, you can't ever feel secure and safe for very long when you're into controlling the conditioned realm. Just trying to keep it under, you know, your power to, to keep the illusion that everything's okay, everything's all right. Because some people, the control freaks, we all have a certain amount of that in, in our personalities, the wanting to control things. Because losing control on a personal level is probably one of the most frightening things you can imagine. You know, the, I'm afraid I might lose control. And, and that panic, that sense of, if I lose control, I'll make a fool of myself, I'll go crazy. So uh, trying to keep control is, is like this desperate rigidity that we can uh, project onto life out of fear and ignorance. So this uh, awakening to Dhamma, Bhutto Tamo Sanko. Now that's the, this is what I, you know, what I'm always pointing to, even though I gave you the precepts this evening, is not to be seen as, uh, in a personal way. It's the Sangha, uh, you know, it's the Sangha giving you the precepts. So now in some kind of formal, conventional way, you're, you've committed yourself to the refuge in Sangha taking the eight precepts and three refuges as an anagarika anagarika. So, I mean, this is, this is uh, not to be seen as some kind of personal achievement. Or if you do, I mean, it's a thing to praise a person about. It's, a, it's a certainly a noble thing to be doing. <coughs> but it can't stop there because it'll get boring after a while. And, and onerous, and even though inspired now, it can become 
desperate in, in a not, not very long time, uh, if it's just taken on a personal level. So, the, the, to remind you, um, the, the whole point of this ceremony, eight precept ceremony, is, is to make this determination for reality, realization, liberation from delusion, so that your relationship to the conditioned realm is no longer at, out of ignorance and attachment to it. And that's the problem. The, that is the basic problem, is ignorance of Nama and attachment to conditions. So the control freak is attached, you know, you're desperately attached to conditioned phenomena in order to feel important or safe or secure or uh, you know, give this illusion, everything is okay, everything is all right. So when that illusion breaks down, you know, like I've found as a Buddhist monk, being in this form, it gives you this sense of, of relief, of not being a person anymore. Not using my personality as my refuge and the way I relate and define myself and experience life, not through the personal tendencies or emotional habits. So you, as you investigate Dhamma, begin to look into it, it's reflecting on the way it is and so they, it's very simple, I mean, all conditions are impermanent, anicca dukkanata, there's the kind of, you hear over and over again, anicca dukkanata, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and non-self. So these are the characteristics of all conditioned phenomena, the physical body, emotional habits, thoughts, memories, psychic experiences, previous life memories, fears and desires, whatever they might be, good and bad, right and wrong. Everything is seen in terms of all conditions are impermanent. The pace and karani cha. All conditions. The pay sankara. All conditions are anicca, impermanent. Now that's not a belief. I'm not asking you to believe that and just grasp that is Buddhist doctrine. That's to be, you know, you, you really need to see it, to awaken, to change to trust yourself, to just be aware of whatever you're feeling right now is like this. And you're, you're not trying to justify it or criticize it or get rid of it, but to be the observer of it. The puto seeing the dhammo, the, the dhamma or the way it is. So this is, uh, this is the point of this life, this is the whole meaning of this convention is, is not for identity, not for attachment, but for liberation. <coughs> it's an expedient means. Monastic life is expedient means. It's not an end in itself. It's not to become a bhikkhu or a thiladhara or an ajahn or something like this, to be a meditation teacher, or, uh, you know, attain some kind of worldly status. If, you know, we can use the form in a worldly way. Even though the word bhikkhu means one who's dependent on the goodwill of others, it could be a kind of like a priestly title. I'm a bhikkhu. And that means I'm you know, I'm a holy man. I'm a, I am a meditation master. People call me a meditation master. I've never called myself that. <laughs> or a, a meditation teacher or an ajahn. I'm an ajahn. I'm an acharya. I am 42 vasas. 
<laughs> I don't know, like this, this is, this is, uh, these, this could be merely stating, you know, conventional terms, or it can be a position I take on life. If I've used those perceptions as to attachment and ignorance, then I've wasted 42 years of my life. It's been a waste of time. If, if that's all I've learned is just to, to uh, congratulate myself on my senior position. But it isn't that, because the word bhikkhu means one who's dependent. I mean, you're putting yourself at the bottom of the heap by becoming, by being a bhikkhu. You're at the bottom, you're dependent on the goodwill of other people for the basic necessities, for food, for shelter, for clothing, for medicine. It's not about privilege and rights. When you, when you become uh, a samana, then you're putting yourself right at the bottom of the heap of the society. And yet we can hold ourselves as if we're somehow superior to the rest. <coughs> we're, whole, we're, we're monastics, we're, we, we're celibate, we're very pure. And somehow we're, that means on an ego level we're somehow a little better than the lay people. It can be a very arrogant attachment if we, if we misuse this convention. <clears throat> so it's a very different thing than becoming a priest. Like a priest is usually a, a functionary in a society, like it performs royal ceremonies or has a special status uh, that is a priestly status, like a, a Brahmanical priest, or even in the Christian religion, it's a kind of, has, gives you status. Just like being a Buddhist monk or nun can give us status in the society. So it's easy to turn our life into a position of status, meaning that we're seeing ourselves as somehow above the, the vulgar herd, slightly better than the people who, who don't keep eight precepts. Now that is, that's Sakya Ditti, that's a personality view, isn't it? That's a misuse. That's a, a lack of wisdom in regard to, in regard into the monastic form. So that's where it's very encouraging you to reflect on uh, on the, the point of this. Bhikkhu isn't isn't a kind of I'm a privileged you know I'm somehow better than a thiladara because I'm a bhikkhu, and I'm a senior bhikkhu so I'm better than a junior bhikkhu. And uh, I'm better than, than other bhikkhus because uh, some bhikkhus uh, I know carry money in their bags and I don't. So I'm purer than those bhikkhus who don't keep the vinaya. So I could become arrogant and supercilious by being strict and uh, highly moral and pompous and become very arrogant kind of uh, bore through being a Buddhist monk. But the point of the life is not to be that way, is, it? is to investigate this conditioned realm so it's not no longer having to, to uh, just be rebellious against it or critical of it, but to understand it that there's no self, there's no bhikkhu, you know, kind of personal bhikkhu. That's an empty form. It's merely a, an expedient word to remind oneself that you're, you're dependent on the goodwill of others. And it doesn't mean to be obsequious and, and kind of 
have to really be nice and sweet so people will cough up the food and the shelter. <laughs> now, it's not about being a, a, an obsequious sycophant and uh, trying to please everybody and make everybody happy so that they'll feed me. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 74. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's, it's about practice uh, the, that this, this, this whole tradition has been able to survive 2,551 years, 52 years, for some reason or other, because if there are those samanas who practice for liberation. And that is, then, then that is praiseworthy, that is something to respect, those practicing for liberation, not those who, who just hold on to positions and identities with religious forms. So this is uh, an encouragement to, to uh, you know, to examine this life. How, how do you want to use this form? It's up to you. I can't, you know, I can't force you or compel you, but encourage you is about the best I can do. And it's a very good form, you know, it's a very powerful form if used properly and used continuously till you have this breakthrough. Because I found you actually have a breakthrough where this, this unshakability, this sense of, of this st inner stillness is so strong that, the, uh, that it's no longer just having to chant mantras, puto, 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 and all that, because you, you find you're in a natural state of awareness. It has its own sustainability. It's not me, Ajahn Sumato, trying to meditate anymore. It's a natural state uh, that one recognizes through mindfulness, sati, sampachanya discerning. So this discernment comes through recognizing the nature of conditioned phenomena, whatever it is, significant, insignificant, important, stupid, silly, wise, great, magnificent, true or false, right or wrong, good or bad. It is it's not about, those are qualities or condition of conditioned phenomena. But all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. So this is this reminding, reminder to be the knower of impermanence allows you to break through the illusions that we have, that we're conditioned by from culture, from from identity with uh, the body, with the with the personal, with the memories we have, the emotions that that we have. But it do, does take determination. So over the years, you know, I remember spending years just chanting mantra, puto, puto, and things like this. The morning and evening pujas. These are ways of, of, con of skillful means of reminding oneself to, to develop that sense. You know, especially like morning puja, wake up and have to, when you don't want to. Remember here at Amravati in the early years when it, we, before we had uh, convenient places to live and heating, to get up out of your bed into a cold room and go to a morning puja was a great act of will because, you know, if somebody gave me a nice duvet, I remember, and uh, 
And it was so nice, you know, on a cold morning to just curl up in the duvet. And that's a nice feeling to be warm when you know when you get out of that under, from underneath that duvet, it's cold. And cold is not, I don't like, I'm born under the sign of the sun. So I like warmth. And some of the monks, I remember, were jumping in the swimming pool, breaking the ice, and I could never do that. I never had enough willpower to make myself break the ice in that pool uh, and, and jump into an ice-cold pool. However, the monks that did that have all disrobed. <laughs> but <laughs> So it doesn't prove very much that you, you maybe have credible willpower to, <coughs> to do outrageous things. But the, this kind of determination, uh, a kind of continuous determination, aditana, to make determination, to, to develop this, this sense of morning puja, like over the years, uh, you know, just uh, chanting the uh, the qualities of Buddha Dhamma Sangha, reminding oneself, is, has a good effect over a long period of time. Evening puja. These are, uh, you know, here for to be useful for developing awareness, mindfulness, reminders. Because we can, you know, be quite indulgent in monastic life. And uh, we have all kinds of other distractions, possibilities for distracting ourselves. So it does take t this determination that is, um, you know, inexorable. It's just, no matter what, you know, you just keep doing it till eventually. And th this investigating, this that which is aware of this emotion, the emotion, feeling happy or sad or inspired or depressed, it is what it is. That which is aware of that feeling, is that the feeling? So it's like inquiring, continuous inquiry. And, and this feeling of feeling depressed, is that what is aware of that feeling? Is that awareness itself depressed? And, and even though these might sound like rhetorical questions, they do have a point because you begin to see that the feeling of feeling depressed or excited or happy or sad, and it is what it is. So you're not trying to, you're not judging it and criticizing it or claiming it, you're aware of it. And that which is aware, you find your stability, your certitude in the awareness, not in, the, in trying to control the, the mind according to where you have only happy emotions or positive feelings. So also r remind yourself that personalities never become enlightened. So we manifest through our personalities. We all, you know, so different monks and nuns have different personalities. That, that doesn't seem to change all that much. But the identity with the personality that that we let go of my personality is merely what it is. It's a habit, you know, so it's the conditions, karmic conditions that, I, that I've developed in this life. It's, no, it's not a way of trying to justify my personal uh, disadvantages or problems, but it is a way of reflecting that that this uh, the personality is not where it's at. You know, you you lie, I remember making judgments about ajans in Thailand. When you're a new monk, you you kind of 
especially from the United States, you can be very critical. You think, now that's a good monk. He's, he's really full of compassion and he's, I really like him. He must be an arahant. And then you go to another one. I, I don't like him at all. He's an old grump. He couldn't be an arahant, wouldn't be a grump. Arahant would be like a saint that have a halo and radiate light and love me. And so this is uh, this is the conceit of uh, of an ignorant person uh, who's who's making judgments on the surface of how somebody manifests all through their personality. With yourself also begin to see your personality as empty rather than as judging it as as good, bad, right, or wrong. Or me and mine, I am this kind of person. And that we are very strongly attached to some of our identities. What kind of person I am. My feelings and my, my needs are so important to me. We can actually believe this and, and, and operate from this kind of position of, of conceit. But as we see through that, then that we no longer want to do that even. It's, it's not a pleasant thing to be a person. It's not a, something that, that I want to cultivate as a personality, but to uh, cultivate this emptiness, this non-person, anatta, it's not something I c it's not something at all. It's when I talk about cultivating, it is through letting go of conditioned phenomena. Through seeing the suffering I create about attaching to the conditions. The body, the personality, memories, emotions. So this is... Uh, for reflection, encouragement. Uh, Amravati is a, the whole point of this monastery is to keep pointing in that direction. And where is it pointing to? Not, not up to the full moon, because that will change very soon. But here, it's like here, looking, looking at, at your heart or your, what they call in Thai, your jit, jitta. Being aware, awake of consci uh, consciously awake of the feelings, sensations that you're experiencing, without judging them, it's non-critical, but it's discerning, discerning the condition as the condition, and the unconditioned is the reality, is here and now. And as we trust in that more and more, then it, it, you know, we, that is our refuge. That's the whole point of this. That's what Sangha means. Supatipanna, one who practices in this way to be free from delusion. So I offer this for your reflection. <laughs>